Hoping everybody can see me. I've just turned my video on very briefly, um, so you can you can uh, each of us as, as presenters and facilitators will turn our, our video on very briefly during this presentation, just so you can see who we are. Um, so. I am our Occupational Therapy and Developmental Portfolio Manager, um, and I'm delighted to f facilitate this um, webinar today. Um, I am an occupational therapist by background, um, but I manage, I manage um, quite a, a, a large portfolio of uh, assessments within Pearson Clinical Assessments. Um, I'm going to hand you over briefly to Helene, or Dr. Helene Dumas, who will do a brief presentation and turn her video on briefly. Um, we're each going to turn our videos off after we've finished speaking, just to save bandwidth, because they don't tend to, <laughs> doesn't tend to help during the presentation. So I'm going to turn mine off and just pass you briefly on to Helene and then it'll come back to me to do the, the instructions for CEs and disclosures, etc. So Helene, over to you. Hi everyone, my name is Helene Dumas. I am a physical therapist by clinical background and I currently work in the Medical Rehab Research Center at Franciscan Children's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. Uh, Franciscan Children's is a pediatric post-acute care hospital. Um, I am also a author, a senior author of the PDCAT and I'm very happy to be able to um, talk to you about that today. So I'm gonna pass you over to Maria, one of my uh, co-authors and co-presenter. Hi, I'm uh, Maria Fregala-Pinkham. I'm also a physical therapist and one of the authors of the PDCAT as well. I am currently a manager of research and quality improvement at Boston Children's Hospital in, um, Boston, in the US um, and I see outpatients. I'm gonna now pass it back over to Shelley. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Um, okay, so let's um, move on with today's um, session. Thank you ever, ever so much for attending, everybody. As um, Sherry said, if you have any questions throughout, um, manning the chat box will be myself um, and my colleague, um, Dr. Susan Nicholson, who's also an occupational therapist. She will be assisting and we'll both be managing the chat. I will come back on at the end to um, ask some questions live of, of Helena Maria. So if you do have questions throughout, please um, feel free to post them in the chat and some will respond to, some will hold till the end. And if we can't get a response during the session, we will um, respond to it afterwards. So in terms of CEs for today, um, this um, session has been approved for ASHA and AOTA CEs. We also provide um, NASP and APA CEs as well. So instructions for submission submitting ASHA CEs, um, you need to complete the forms that are available to download in the um, event resources under the chat box. You can download the, the forms from there. You will need to complete the ASHA attendance sheets um, if more than one person is attending at your site. You will need to re um, complete the participate, participant form and the evaluation form. And you need to return those no later than um, 30th of November to Darlene Davis and the details are on your screen here and these details are also in your, your handouts in the PDF of the handouts. Um, one thing I will say is if you can make sure you email us PDFs, not a photograph because the quality of the photo image isn't strong enough to, to actually get the right information from it. So it does need to be a PDF format that you send back through to us. Um, in terms of um, AOTA, NASP and APA. Um, again, the relevant forms are available for download. And again, these need to be returned no later than 11.30 to Darlene Davis, the details on the screen. Um, and again, it's the same instructions, no, um, no photo, but PDFs, but there's just slightly different forms that need to be completed depending on which CEs you're applying for. Um, you will notice that two of our presenters today are PTs. Um, obviously today's session is also relevant for, for, for physical therapists. Um, we don't have, um, we don't provide approved CEs through APTA, um, but we will provide a certificate of attendance. Um, so you can request a certificate, certificate of attendance for today's session. Um, so on that note, I'm just going to mention disclosure information really briefly. Um, as um, Dr. Dumas and Dr. Fragala Pinkham mentioned, they're both authors of the PDCAT and they provide consultation to CER, um, CRE Care about the PDCAT. Um, they are the publishers of the PDCAT, but we are the exclusive distributors of the PDCAT on Q Global. Um, both of them receive either, um, Dr. Dumas receives a speaking fee and free access to the PDCAT software, and Dr. Fragala Pinkham has received um, free access to the PDCAT um, um, through her uh, grant applications and they're both involved in 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 um 
in ongoing developments with the PDCAP, basically. So you can see all that information on your screen and it's all there available on the um, materials that you were sent before or that you saw beforehand. In terms of learner outcomes, I'm not going to read through these. Um, they, um, again, are on the registration information beforehand, but you can see them on the screen here. And I think we really want to get to um, the, the content of today's webinar. So here's a brief outline of the schedule. Um, so there'll be an introduction, we'll go through a case demonstration, then we'll go through the PDCAT in research, and we'll have some time for questions and answers at, at the end of the session. And on that note, I'm going to pass you over to Helene. Um, hopefully this slide's the right one for you to start at, Helene, and um, right. away we go. Great, thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I'm going to start by uh, briefly providing some background information to, a, uh, to that may be a repeat for some people that have been with us before um, or that are very familiar with the PDCAT, um, but I hope to get the audience all on the same page so that when we move to talking about um, case applications, um, the background information will be helpful with that. So with that being said, let me introduce the PDCAT. And, and what the PDCAT actually is. So the PDCAT, which was published in 2012, is an expanded and revised functional assessment based on the original paper, uh, paper pencil version of the Pediatric Evaluation of Disability Inventory, typically referred to as the PD. So a computer adaptive test format was developed to advance measurement for children with the use of the available technology nowadays, including personal computers, iPads, and software programming, and it allows for increased efficiency and reduced burden for families and clinicians. So what are the features of the PDCAT? It's for children and youth ages birth to 21 years. The PDCAT can be used across all diagnoses, conditions, and settings, and focuses on activities and participation in life tasks. Age, gender, and mobility device filters are incorporated in the software to prevent irrelevant items from being presented to the respondent. And due to the nature of the computer adapting uh, testing aspect of the PDCAT, it's br brief, but yet precise. So the PDCAT was developed for the identification of functional delay in children to examine the improvement for an individual child after intervention is provided and to evaluate and monitor group progress, um, either in program evaluation or research. So as I said, the PDCAT is a computer adaptive test, as a computer adaptive test of the, of the PD. So how does that work? Computer adaptive testing uses artificial intelligence to select the most relevant items from a pre-programmed um, bank of validated test items. The banks are specific to each functional domain and each individual item in the bank represents a different level of difficulty um, so the PDCAT is from the most difficult um, to the easiest to perform. And this is all based on a statistical method called um, item response theory. So without giving, going too much into statistics, item response theory is a statistical method that uses, uses a scale um, to put items on a continuum, as I said, from um, easy to difficult or difficult to easy. It, just, it provides a, a framework for modeling the response data. So, it, and therefore the software can then provide item score estimations for the respondent um, to the PDCAT. So this is a picture of an item map that shows how items which are on the left-hand side on the, on the um, y-axis are distributed along a continuum of difficulty. And this, uh, according to the scaled scores where they would fall on the PDCAT and that the scaled scores are along the x-axis. And we'll talk more about item maps um, as we go on and do cases um, shortly. But the IRT model, the statistical model is used to evaluate respondents without depending on the same items being included in the test every time because it uses prediction of a person's abilities or traits. And each time a respondent replies to an item, the score is updated. The PDCAT items and the scoring range can be pictured like a ruler. So there are items that are at the lower end of the ruler, in the middle, and at the higher end or the more difficult end. So pictured here are examples from the mobility domain. 
you'll see the bolded item stands for a few minutes is the first item for all respondents. And as shown on the ruler, this item is in the middle of the level of difficulty or the difficulty range based on our original standardization sample when the PDCAT was developed. So when someone, when a new respondent starts the PDCAT and if the item um, is scored, this item stands for a few minutes is scored as either hard or unable by the respondent, the next PDCAT item presented will be from the lower end of the ruler. If the item is scored easy, the next item that, that is presented to the respondent on the next screen um, would be one that is scaled higher on the ruler. So for each functional domain within the PDCAT, all respondents, as I said, begin with an item in, in the middle, middle of the range. And then that each item then dictates which item, a harder or easier item, will be presented next. With each new response, a score, the score and the confidence interval are re-estimated and the, this CAT software, the computer adaptive testing software, determines whether um, the stopping rules for the software have been met. So from our user perspective, how is the PDCAT administered? Well, there's no special environment needed. There are no uh, materials or activities necessary other than um, the computer or iPad um, with the PDCAT software um, to use the PDCAT measure. Um, the respondent for the PDCAT may be a parent or maybe a clinician, and the PDCAT can be used on multiple occasions for the same child. It can also be used as frequently as desired and no minimum time must pass between assessments. Most importantly is the focus of the PDCAT is on typical performance at the present time when, when clinicians or parents are responding to the items. The PDCAT currently has two versions. There is a content balance version and a speedy version of the PDCAT. The user selects the version each time a new test is begun. The speedy version is the fastest way to get an accurate and precise score and is usually preferred for individual assessments as it does not sample, does not forcefully sample all content areas within a domain. The content balance version will present the respondent with more items, and that could be up to 30 items, as items from each content area within a functional domain are forced to appear by the software. For example, the daily activities uh, domain has four content areas. They're getting dressed, keeping clean, home tasks, and eating and mealtime. If a user chooses um, the content balanced version and wants to, wants to respond to items in the daily activities domain, the content balanced version will make sure that there are items from all of those areas presented to the respondent. So again, therapists or clinicians may choose to use either version at any time as scores on the PD and the content balance, though not identical, have been shown to be within the margin of error su suggested by the standard error. So the PDCAT can be used to evaluate activity in three functional domains, daily activity, mobility, and social cognitive. The PDCAT mobility domain also includes a 12 item wheelchair subdomain. This subdomain appears only if the mobility domain has been selected for the user and if the user indicates the child is able to propel a manual wheelchair on the initial demographic screen. The PDCAT's fourth domain is the responsibility domain. This is more aligned with the ICF participation dimension or the involvement in life situations. Each domain can be tested alone or tested along with others. PDCAT items fall into the content areas listed above for each or listed on your slide for each domain. The content areas are visible um, only on the PDCAT scoring item map, which we will again go look at uh, later, but the content areas are not um, visible to the respondent. So when folks are responding to the items on the PDCAT for the daily activities, mobility, and social cognitive domains, they're presented with a four-point response scale. They score each item as the child is unable, it's hard for the child, a little hard, or easy. 
There's also an I don't know option, which essentially allows the respondents to skip that item. For the responsibility domain, there's a five point response scale. And this ranges from the adult caregiver having full responsibility and the child not taking any responsibility for a particular item to the child taking full responsibility without any direction, supervision, or guidance from an adult caregiver. The PDCAT produces two types of score reports upon test completion, where both normative and scaled scores are available. This is an example of a summary score report for one testing date. Again, you'll see scaled scores and normative scores are calculated by the PDCAT software and presented in the score report. The normative scores are based on a child's chronological age and can be used to compare a child's functioning relative to other children of, the, of a comparable age. The PDCAT normative scores are provided as age percentiles and T-scores. As noted, normative scores describe the child's performance and compare it to children of the same age. These normative scores were derived from the standardization sample of 2,200 typically developing children and reflect the general U.S. pediatric population. The normative scores, as I said, are presented as T-scores in which the mean for each age group is 50 with a standard deviation of 10. Typically, scores between 30 and 70, so the mean plus or minus two standard deviations, are considered within the expected range for age. We always caution, however, that individual programs or institutions may set their own criteria, and users should keep in mind that the T-score of 50 on the PDCAT represents the average for a particular age group. Therefore, the pattern of item performance represented by a score of 50 may differ considerably between age groups. The PDCAT also produces scaled scores. Scaled scores for the PDCAT are on a 20 to 80 metric, and these can be used to evaluate a child's functional skills and progress over time. The scores fall within the standard error of measurement, um, regardless of the version of the PDCAT, as I said, for content balance or speedy, um, and again, allowing for interchangeable use of the two versions. Scaled scores are not adjusted for age, and the PDCAT scaled scores are based on that sequential and hierarchical, hierarchical model of item responses calculated from the original standardization sample. Scaled scores provide an indication of the performance of the child along a continuum of the relatively easy to more difficult items. A higher score, a higher scaled score, means that the child's performance of skills or level of responsibility is greater. So scaled scores are re recommended to track functional progress in children not expected to catch up to same age peers. Here's an example, a table that um, compares um, normative standard scores and scaled scores on the PDCAT. In this example, the child Lizzie's initial test one PDCAT mobility normative scores were a T-score of less than 10 and an age percentile of less than, less than the fifth percent. When retested a few months later, um, the sc scores were the same for test two. These scores indicate that Lizzie's mobility function was well below that of her same age peers on both test dates. If you look at the scaled score for mobility, uh, test one was a 56 on our 20 to 80 scale, and her test score, test two, was a 64, indicating that while she has not caught up to her peers, as with the normative scores, she has made a positive improvement over time. The item maps, which we touched on briefly um, so far, um, are generated at the conclusion of a test. Item maps are available for each domain and illustrate placement of a child's skills along the functional, functional continuum for that domain. This is an example of the daily activities item map for a content balanced speedy cat. PDCAT assessment. We know that a content balance assessment was used because more than 15 items are highlighted, have answers or responses here in red, um, and that all four um, content areas have, in, have responses. So the responses are indicated by the red squares around the one to four um, response options, one representing an unable response all the way um, to the left, and four represents an easy response 
And again, these are two specific items and the fours are more to the right. The gray line indicates the, the scaled score, I'm sorry, the red line with the gray box around it um, indicating the standard error for that scaled score. And the items are listed by content area on the left-hand side of the page. When the PDCAT was first developed, um, we, did, we developed it, for, as I said, for all um, di diagnoses and conditions. Since then, the, an autism spectrum um, disorder module has been developed. This can be selected um, and used by choosing yes on the demographic page to the question if the child has been diagnosed with ASD. The same versions, the content balance and the speedy versions are still used with the ASD module. The same domains are often also used with the ASD module. There are some, however, some item and scoring differences. For instance, in the daily activities domain, there are eight additional items in the item bank for the software to choose from. For the social cognitive domain, there are eight new and 11 revised items and some changes to the scaled scoring. For the responsibility domain, there are again, eight newer revised items. And those had to do with wording and or directions. There was no change to any of the items in the mobility domain or the scoring with the development of the ASD module. Here's an example of where you would find the question um, to how you would um, use the ASD module. On this demographic page, has this individual been diagnosed with ASD? If you check yes, um, then the ASD domains will, will appear. Here's an example of the um, social cognitive first page. Um, because the first item in the social cognitive ASD um, module is different than the first question or the first item in the uh, traditional PDCAT social cognitive um, presentation. And the, in the original PDCAT, the first social cognitive item that appears is recognizes numbers on a clock or phone. And the ASD module, the first item that appears is explains reasons behind actions, such as why he or she spent money on a particular item. So that is one of the changes. On the score reports, it is indicated over on the left-hand side where the domains are that the ASD um, module was chosen. But here, you'll see the uh, normative scores are in the same place on the summary report, as are the scaled scores for the ASD domain. The PDCAT is available on uh, several different platforms. Um, the PDCAT online in, is online in the Pearson Clinical Assessment on the Q Global platform. PDCAT is available um, on a Windows platform, and the PDCAT can be um, used on an iPad through the um, Apple Store, and this, the app is available for purchase still until uh, December 2021. I should also mention before we go on to our cases that there are many translations available um, for the PDCAT now, but at present these differ um, by platform. So if you're interested in a translated version of the PDCAT, uh, checking the platform and what languages are available um, is important. So that was a brief and quick um, introduction and overview of the PDCAT so we can move on now to talk about um, applying the PDCAT um, with clinical cases. So I'm going to turn it over to Maria to do that. Okay, great. Um, so for, um, I'm going to start with um, a couple of cases um, and uh, to illustrate how to use the PDCAT. So our first case is a seven-year-old girl named Nellie who has a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, spastic diplegia, gross motor function classification system level three, and a max manual ability classification system level one. So Nellie walks with forearm crutches in her home and school, um, and she uses a wheelchair for long distance in her community setting. She does need some assistance on stairs and on uneven surfaces. So she recently had uh, Botox injections to her medial hamstrings, her hip ab adductors, and her gastrox. And um, so she was referred for therapy. In addition, her mother identified that she would like her daughter to be able to improve some self-care skills. 
So she was referred to OT and PT. So why would I use the PD cat with Nellie? So, and um, even though I am an author of the PD cat, it is definitely not the only tool I use. It's one of the tools that I use in the clinic setting to complement um, other tools that, and to gather information about a child and provide information uh, to inform my intervention and to measure outcomes on my interventions. So in, in addition to using the PDCAT, uh, or in addition to actually to recording self-care and gross motor capacity um, for Nellie. So for example, capacity meaning a test and as a physical therapist, I often will use the gross motor function measure, measure for a child with cerebral palsy to look at the, the child's capacity, their ability to do these gross motor activities on the gross motor function measure um, in my clinic setting. So she has the capability or the capacity to do these activities, but what does she really do in the, her typical settings? And that's what the advantage is of the PDCAT. So I can see what she does on the gross motor function measure of walking up and down four steps, but I wanna know what does she do in her school, home and community settings? And that's the information that the PDCAT will supplement and give me. Um, and I can use this to look at, you know, what is her baseline in the school? Is there a difference between her capacity or capability and what she's actually typically, how she's typically performing? And I can use it to look at change over time and progress. So here's um, some scores. So these are the initial Nellie's inter um, scores on um, a, as a summary report. And as you can see in the summary report, um, there's the red bar, which lists, which gives us the categories on the summary report. On the left is the all the domains. And you can see that there were two assessments. So I can select the date range. And then I can look at assessment dates, her initial assessments, and then her discharge assessments um, for an episode of care um, as being July and through um, November. Okay. Her scaled scores are next in the next column and then standard errors. And then there's normative T scores and um, score um, and percentiles as well. So that gives me an indication that when um, Nellie first came to, to um, outpatient PT and OT, that her daily activity scores, um, she had her T score and her percentiles were decreased compared to typically developing peers. And as you can see on discharge, she was able to increase those scores um, to, uh, to a higher range. So she was um, functioning closer to her peers in that range. And then also on her scaled scores, you can see the mobility um, scale score of 50, and then she had a scaled score of 58 on her discharge, and that indicated an improvement. Whereas her scaled scores, um, sorry, um, sorry about that. Um, on her uh, T scores, she did not, um, she still um, is delayed compared to her, her typically developing peers. So she has a 23 on her, on her T-score and a less than five in her percentile. Um, the nice thing is that you can look at um, her scaled scores and look at the change over time. So I would look at, for example, I'm gonna use mobility and I would look at her standard era um, and if I want to be 95%, look at two confidence intervals, I'm going to say that um, a score of a little over two, or, or we'll say three to make it, uh, to round it off. Um, so a, a, a 53 or higher would indicate that she made a significant improvement in her mobility skills. And you can see that she achieved that. And then you can go across for each of those um, domains to look at change over time. Here is the item map of her initial item map. So for this, um, for this child, I selected a speedy um, to look at that. I can tell, well, I can tell from her um, initially, if I were to go back and look, um, it indicates a speedy on her summary report, but I can also tell by um, her item map that um, she doesn't have 
items in all of the content areas. So a, a content balanced would give me content in each of those content areas. But I didn't, because she um, has a diagnosis of CP and GMFCS level three, I didn't think that the running and playing content area was going to give me as much information as I wanted more of a focus on her standing and walking domain. So I was able to focus and just do a quick um, speedy on this. And you can see as Helene outlined earlier that the vertical line is her scaled score. The gray area is her standard error. And then her the highlighted in red are the items that were administered. Um, just because I didn't administer some of the items, I can also use this item map to look at what are the items along that continuum of the, the vertical line? What are the items below, or what are the scores and, and items that fall either higher or lower? And, and where would I expect her to function? Um, and and look at those items and use that for program planning as to what are the next steps of things that I might want to work on um, and or is she functioning, you know, even asking the family how she's functioning on those things and is she in the, the range that I would expect her to be in. Here is the same idea, same issues. This is the mobility item map. Um, so you can see that there's not as many items on this map but we'll go on to show you two others. Um, so most, sorry, I messed up with, the first one was the daily activities. So I was talking about mobility, I jumped ahead. So going back to daily activities, um, most of her items were in the um, keeping clean and some in the meal time, as I can see on this item map. And that fits what um, her mother wanted her, some of the things that she wanted to work on. But if they weren't item, if they didn't fit into that, we could do a content balance, or we could also look at um, what are the, as I said, look at the items that cluster around that bar and um, those numbers indicating her ability level and how much assistance she needs for things. All right, so back to the mobility. So this is the general mobility item map. In addition, the next part is the walking aid. So it's a separate item map just because everything wouldn't fit um, on one map, but the mobility items with walking um, aid items is part of the mobility domain. So these are additional items that focus on use of walking with a walking aid and it, it has steps and inclines and then just standing and walking activities. And you see that this, this makes sense that a lot of these were administered and these are things that we're working on and her current level of function. In addition, the wheelchair item map was, it, the wheelchair items were administered and that's a separate item map. The wheelchair is a subdomain of the mobility domain um, and there are 12 items on the wheelchair um, subdomain, and all of them are administered generally. Um, there's only if um, you get multiple ones or easy ones in a row that you will um, not um, have those administered. All right, so our next case is Charlie, and he is a 14-year-old boy with Down syndrome. Um, he attends a public middle school in his hometown and he receives special education services. He participates in a um, academic, an integrated academic class. He's able to communicate in full sentences. He requires supervision when eating and using the restroom in the school setting. Um, he does not have a one-to-one -one aid, but he relies on his general classroom aid and sometimes his classmates for assistance within the classroom. And the concerns now are his team, he's, he's in middle school and he's preparing to transition to his high school and beyond that um, into you know what, what his plans are for after high school as well. And so his team um, is looking for an outcome to assist with evaluating his current status and to really look at um, um, how he's functioning compared to peers. So, why use the PDCAT for Charlie? Um, well, one thing is that um, 
as I had said, even for our first case, Nellie, is that it provides information on typical performance in the school setting. Um, or in their 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 setting, and so for here, we're going to ask the teachers to um, to respond and and or clinicians to let us know what the typical information is, uh, or typical performance in his school setting. So at home, he's able to independently eat and he toilets, but um, in the school, the environment is less structured. Um, he has different areas where he might eat or or use the restroom, and he can become distracted. Um, he needs supervision for safety and eating, um, and even using the restroom, he rem needs reminders to maybe lock, he has difficulty locking the stall door or things like that. So this will give us information on his typical setting for this being his school setting and how he's functioning. It also will give us information on um, his level of um, independence and comparison to his same age peers. Um, so it gives us this baseline that we can compare over time and look at the item content within um, what is administered and what's not administered to really help with program planning. All right. So here is a um, summary report of um, Charlie's normative scores. As you can see in the summary, it lists all of the domains, um, the assessment date, and his scaled scores. Etc. For this, um, because um, of the general functioning uh, of um, Charlie, decided to do a content balance. We wanted more information um, under each of the content areas um, and to really get a thorough, um, in thorough information about items and for program planning. And because he was functioning in a range that was appropriate to to allow us to do that um, and, and functioning within those or high, in the higher range of, um, of items and domains. So here's an example of um, the same um, assessment data, but a detailed report. And for this detailed report, this lists not only the scores, but it lists every item and the response to each item. So this can help us with clinical decision making about um, you know, what to do in terms of next steps for this individual. So um, for the normative scores, it can help us with eligibility. So we can say that, as we know, um, even before we administer this, we know that he has delayed skills just because of how he's functioning, but this gives us a quantitative number of how he's performing in each of the domain areas and can provide some um, information in determining his um, service eligibility based on his age and level of delay. In addition, the scale scores will help us provide an indication of where he falls um, in these functional areas and what are the next steps? What are the next skills that he needs to acquire to improve his function? Um, and we can monitor these, um, this progress over time. So here, as I said, that it can help with intervention planning. So specifically, you know, we can look at what are the specific areas that he needs help with? What are the items that might compose of that? In addition to what do we observe in the school setting and, and um, what he needs to do? So um, this just provides us with some ideas for task-based intervention and, you know, how do we, how are we going to address this? What things can be done? What are things that are more relevant to the home setting? What are things that are more relevant to the school setting? So, um, you know, does he need to work on, you know, they're uh, traveling safely within the community might be one of the items um, that might be need to be addressed? Is it something that he needs to work on, keeping his personal electronic devices in working order? Again, another item um, on the PDCAT that he might need to work on that he needs to do at home, but also in, in the school setting. Um, here's an example of the item map. And as you can see in the content um, balanced uh, version, there are the red um, squares indicate items that were administered and where his ability falls. I would look at some of these things of where, as you can see, there are some items that are shifted left. And those might be items of opportunity where we can work on those to get them to the same, 
to the same level of functioning as other content areas. In addition to what are the items or, or content or ability levels that he's currently doing and can we bump him up a notch from using a lot of guidance to maybe less guidance um, and um, structure. And then here is his mobility domain. So similar, um, similar con uh, concepts uh, with a range of um, items. As you can see, the mobility item is a lot more um, hierarchical in, in nature of the skills. And obviously one of the content areas is ba basic movement. Um, and you can see that that's shifted left. So that's an indication for, of kids that are functioning in that way over to the left are, not ideal candidates for doing a content balanced um, version of the PDCAT. Whereas for Charlie, he's right in that higher range. Um, we get a nice broad range of, of activities that he's able to do. And then one of the, uh, the item maps that we haven't looked at yet is that um, responsibility item map, um, which looks at more on that safety, um, communicate, you know, healthcare needs, organizing and planning, taking care of daily needs, st saying, say, staying safe um, items. Oh, so, so in summary, those are two cases of of how the PDCAT could be used in the clinic setting: one in outpatient, one in the school setting, to look at comparing kids to other peers to see the amount of delay, and then for looking at progress over time and program planning, intervention planning. So in the last webinar that we um, did, uh, there was some questions about, you know, I really liked the old PD um, and I use the old PD. Now, what do we do with those scores? And how, you know, how can we compare them to the PDCAT? How are they compared? Well, the scoring, um, metric is different. Um, so the PD cat was a zero to a hundred. This is a 20 to 80, but in addition, the scoring metric does not um, line up. So a 50 on the PD does not equal a 50 on the PD cat. Um, so what we did is we linked scores of the PD scaled scores on self-care mobility and social function to PD cat scores. And so um, that you can, there are scoring equations that you can plug the numbers in of your PD scores and look at an estimate of what the PD cat, um, you would expect them to get on the PD cat. And so we provided this on this slide, um, a reference and of that um, publication to look at uh, if anybody's interested in looking at those equations. And then briefly, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the PD cat in research. So um, there's been quite a few studies looking at psychometric properties. As a matter of fact, probably the majority of the research right now has um, been done, has been on psychometric properties, which is really important. We need to have good psychometric properties and be confident that the measures that we're using are valid and reliable to give us the information that we can use in the clinic setting. Um, so having said that though, um, probably, it's probably not the most um, interesting things to go through. So, um, and detailed, the very detailed studies, but I just want to kind of do an overview of um, what are the psychometric properties and so what have been tested so far. Um, and it's just really in its infancy of, of testing psychometric properties. When I look back at the PD, which was developed in 1990, I want to say, and, and there's still um, publications coming out on the psychometric prop property. So we'll continue to see that and validation on specific populations and, and things like that. But what's been done so far is um, test retest re reliability has been done and has shown um, some good properties. So, so so a couple of three studies have been done um, looking at that. And what's nice is that um, has shown good reliability. In addition, it has been compared to other functional classifications, um, scales, or other outcome measures. And there's been strong associations showing that there's good concurrent validity. There's also discriminative validity. So a the PD cat is able to discriminate typically developing kids from kids with disabilities. 
It's able to discriminate kids that use a walking aid versus kids that primarily just use a wheelchair for mobility. Um, and it's also been able to discriminate across um, children with gross motor function classifications uh, of, of um, able to walk versus non-ambulatory and manual abilities to have skilled um, ability to manipulate um, or to use the um, hands manually versus kids that have limited ability. Um, there's also been a couple of studies on responsiveness and um, so that um, is promising. We still need more work in this area. Uh, we did a study looking at inpatient pediatric rehab, um, looked at infants and young children, and um, more recently look, looked at the PDCAT in preschool to high school students looking at responsiveness over time. This is some of the information that you can use. We do have minimal detectable change for inpatient use. Um, we do not have that information for outpatient use at this time, and that's why we've recommended using those standard error bars um, or standard error information to use that to look at change over time. Um, in addition, the PDCAT is starting to be used for outcome measures um, uh, as an outcome measure in research. So I won't go over these in detail, but just want you to be aware that that has been used in case reports, case series, as well as single subject design to look at outcomes, rehab outcomes. And then it's being um, used in group studies, um, looking at change over time. And um, there's plans to use it in a randomized control trial. Okay. So I guess at this point, we're going to open um, up for um, questions. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you, everybody. There's been some um, great questions that have um, popped into the chat box while you've been presenting. So if you do have any others, then please put them in there. But I've, I've, I have a few aside um, that, um, that I'm, I'm going to ask um, Helene and Maria live. Um, one question I will answer initially is, um, is we had a question around um, languages that the PDCAT was available in. Um, it is available, I think, um, it, it's available in um, English and US Spanish, but it's also available in lots of other languages like Brazilian Portuguese, um, Italian, um, uh, French Canadian, um, German, um, Dutch, uh, Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish. So I just wanted to mention that because that's that a few people had that um, question. And if you do get access to it, you actually get access to all those languages. You can administer it in any of those languages as well. So, um, so I just thought I'd take the liberty to answer that one um, first of all. Um, so first question for either um, Helene or Maria, whoever wants to step in, is somebody who's asking how the wheelchair um, items were normed. Are you able to speak to that? Sure. Sure, I can do that one. The wheelchair items actually were not normed. For the wheelchair items, you will get a scaled score. Um, and if someone choose, if the respondent or the clinician chooses to have the respondent um, reply to wheelchair items, you have to check off on the demographic page that the child uses a manual wheelchair and that they propel the manual wheelchair. If that's integrated on the dom on the um, demographic page and the mobility domain is chosen, twelve additional wheelchair items will. Um, be presented to the user and a scaled score will be generated. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so um, another question here, and, and, and actually Susan answered this one offline, but I, I think it's a useful one to um, add in the chat here. Um, so is the PDCAT sensitive at identifying risk for ASD or primarily for monitoring children with ASD? And I think that's quite a useful question if you could um, speak to that. Sure, I can say that. Um, I saw Susan's answer too that it, or um, that the PDCAT um, is not a diagnostic tool for ASD. Um, the ASD version has, as we said, um, additional items and or revised items in the daily activities and social cognitive domains, as well as the responsibility domain. And the same um, applications of the PDCAT apply in that, you know, it's to identify um, functional delay and the extent of the functional delay um, in, an, in um, 
in a child as well as, you know, could be used for groups um, in program evaluation and research, but it is not a diagnostic tool. If that, I hope that answers the question. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm going to answer this one, if, 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 I, if you don't mind. There's a couple of questions around using the PDCAT in telehealth or telepractice. Um, oh. And um, that really sort of speaks to the Q Global platform that, that the mm -hmm. PDCAT is on. Yes, you can um, um, administer um, the PDCAT remotely, and that's one of the benefits of it now being on Q Global, is that you, from Q Global, you send a link to the parent or caregiver um, to respond to the PDCAT remotely, so they can respond in their own time um, at their, you know, at, on their own device. So, so it certainly is very, very much used in in that sort of situation where you don't have to actually see the caregiver face to face. So, um, there's about three questions I think that have just asked that same question. So, I hope that's mm -hmm. answered that for those those few people. Um, mm -hmm. Another question now for Helena Maria is, um, uh, da, 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 and that's about purchasing, so I won't answer that. I can answer that one separately. Um, we can score based. I'm, I'm just reading this out, so I've not read it beforehand. We can can we score based on performance in the session, or um, a used parent response is preferred? Um, would you have the child do the item instead? So they're in inpatient setting, working with PTs and acute. Um, change or a new diagnosis and they wanted to know if you you actually just do it all on on parent responses that if, if that's the preferred response or whether you would actually ask the ch child to do some of the items um, I hope that makes sense <laughs> yeah so I, I can sorry I can answer that. I think mm -hmm. that's a good question and I would um, so for that a situation is a little bit different because they may have had a recent injury or a surgery or something so their performance is not going to be you don't want their parent reporting what their performance is at the home setting. You want to know what their performance is now. So it would be during your observation of, and, you, and the therapist, the clinician can complete that as their observation of doing activities. I mean, mostly activities, especially for, um, you know, as a therapist, I'm very familiar with those. So the mobility activities are things that you would do in your typical set, your typical evaluation and looking at um, a child. So you don't even need to ask them to do the activities, but you'd be looking at bed mobility. You'd be looking at how they're walking and how they're doing on stairs and things like that and can report um, how much assistance or, um, or supervision they need for those things. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, another one. Um, if a child scores high on the scaled score, um, if, they're, if they have a PDCAT scale score close to 80, does this indicate that the child is functioning very close to expected levels within their functional skills? Can you explain um, the sort of what that means if a score is close to 80 on the scaled score? Yeah, I mean, um, most likely they are in the higher range, and yes, because that's the end of our scale. So um, there may be some, um, they're, they're, they're performing their typical performance of activities um, is what you would expect, and you look at their, their normative score. However, in addition, we know that um, you know, observation and performance, you know, walking up and down stairs and they might be independent. So that's great. They are able to do that. But maybe the next step is that I would want to take it a step further and look at how long it takes them to do that. Is it easy for them? They they go at a good speed and they can do that. Then, then you would score it at the top of the scale. But maybe I want to look a little bit further and look at their timed up and down stairs and do a different measure to look at that. But generally, if they're you know, 80 out of 80, then they've reached the ceiling on this test. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, another, um, we had a couple of questions um, around this. Um, it's asked, a couple of people have asked, can a caregiver and a clinician both fill out and compare? Um, could they both complete it and you compare their, um, I guess, assessment or their evaluations? Um, are either of you able to speak to that point? Sure. We haven't had... Um... I haven't had that experience. I'm not sure, um, Maria, if you have done that with any of your studies, but I, I don't see why um, that couldn't happen. And I think it could be very interesting and provide some um, a real starting point for a conversation between um, parents and, and clinicians about the current uh, performance of the child and goals. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, another one um, that's just come in, if you have an older child with little or no cognitive delay, can they 
um, answer the questions themselves. Could they self-report, basically, is, is what the question's ask, asking. Mm -hmm. I don't think we'd be able to answer that. Mm -hmm. So we did not design it or validate it for a, parent, for a child self-report. However, I, I do know that it has been used and um, uh, some therapists that, um, in the setting that I work in have used it um, for patients with pain. Um, and they reported that it worked quite well for an inpatient pain rehab, um, inpatient stay, um, and that children were able to understand it and, and, and score themselves. But again, it wasn't, it wasn't designed or validated for that method, but it has been used that way. Excellent, thank you. Okay, there's um, a couple of people asking about purchasing the options. I'm just going to mention briefly that you can find that on our website and at the end of the slide deck there is a link. Um, you just have to set up a Q Global account and you just purchase usages. There's no kits or anything like that to purchase. So um, because this is a CE webinar, I don't really want to go into too much detail on that, but um, you can contact us or email me if you need any more um, help with that and, and it is in your in your slide, in your handout, you'll be able to get that information. So um, hopefully that will that question and I can follow up with people on, on that. Um, right, we've got two minutes available, so um, I think it's probably time for probably two more questions. So um, actually, there's one I'll answer quickly, which is what is the age range for the PDCAT? Um, the age range is, is birth to 20 years, 11 months. But actually, that's probably a good question for Helena or Maria is about using the PDCAT out of age range. And can you use the PDCAT out of age range um, with children older than 20 years, um, 11 months? I don't know if either of you able to speak to that. Sure. We, um, so it can, it can be used for older. So we've had um, some uh, facilities that have that have been using it for years, and they they track kids over time. And so it is able to you you can continue to use it, but you will not get normative scores. You'll just get the scaled scores. So they just want to look at you know are they um, either making progress or are they stabilized and not reclining, re, uh, declining, or reclining, I guess, and relaxing. Anyway. <laughs> okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, let's pick another one. Um, when feeding back to parents, um, do you find it helpful to go into details about the results and with the charts and the scores, or do you just keep it fairly general? Can the statistics get confusing, or do you have any advice around using those um, reports to um, communicate with parents? I think that um, parent, well, in my experience, is that parents really like, especially I use the item maps um, mm -hmm. to show them where their child is um, scoring and, um, but more so like what are the, you know, what would I expect things, uh, items that could change and what things could we work on and, and things like that. And I feel like, um, as again, I'm a PT, but even using the daily activities, um, interestingly, um, I had, I, for a research study, we used it, uh, daily activities and mobility. And parents, interestingly, when for kids with cerebral palsy, they would look at the things and say, "Oh, I never have them help me, you know, clean up, on, uh, remove dishes from the table. I never have them do these items." As they were completing the PDCAT um, items, it gave them ideas of things that maybe they should be working on with or having their children work on at home. Okay, thank you. Right. Um... We're about to finish. I think this will cut us off quite abruptly at the end. So um, thank you, uh, Helene and Maria, for a really, really useful presentation. Um, you will have your um, handouts, which you can download. Any questions, If you, um, we will try and respond to them. Um, the um, CE details are in your handouts as well. And I just want to thank you for attending today. And um, I suspect this might have cut me off at the end because it says my, um, the session has ended. But I'll just say thank you, everybody, and um, have, a, have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.